Hey everyone, it's Leah. Before we begin this week's episode, I wanted to take a minute to let you know that while the coronavirus is a reality and there are a lot of scams and frauds related to the virus popping up, at this time, we do not plan to release episodes related to topics surrounding the virus. We want to use this time while things in the world are on pause to provide great content that will help us grow as professionals through the crisis and after. So when you're tired of hearing the same stories about the virus, know that we will be bringing you interesting, educational, and hopefully fun content within the investigation profession. So stay safe, wash your hands, and hey, if you have an extra minute or two, send us some hometown fraud stories to read on the show. Hi, I'm Leah Wheatholter, owner of Workman Forensics, and this is the Investigation Game Podcast. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. Today I am joined by Gary Graff. Gary is a retired FBI agent who retired after 23 years of service. And during his career, Gary's investigations included those of public corruption, financial crimes, securities frauds, violent crimes, among many others. Additionally, Gary specialized in evidence response, firearms, SWAT and police investigation, crime scene reconstruction, and major case management. After retiring from the FBI, Gary has now developed training courses for investigators, including topics such as crime scene documentation, death investigations, investigative analysis and crime scene reconstruction, shooting incident reconstruction, and bloodstain pattern analysis. I actually met Gary when working for the Tulsa FBI office, and he's helped me on several cases of my own at Workman Forensics. So welcome to the podcast, Gary. Good morning. Good morning. I really love all of these trainings, by the way, that you've been. I follow you on LinkedIn and see some of the pictures from your current trainings, and they just seem really awesome. And sometimes I wish I wasn't a fraud investigator and needed to do some (laughs) crime scene reconstruction training. Well, you're always welcome. Okay, well, I'm going to take you up on it next time you're in town. I'm going to come. As I was putting together the outline for our conversation today, I started thinking about the cases that you did help me on, and it was shortly after you retired. And one of them, I just remember that there was a lady who had stolen money from a credit union. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. And we had to like drive out to the country, and I think the client just was kind of wondering, well, the investigation was pretty tedious on my part, and so we were trying to speed it up. Like, if we could go talk to her, then she could tell us how she did it. And so I remember I called you and said, what if we just show up at her house and knock on the door. And so that's what we did. And she'd already hired an attorney and so wouldn't talk to us. But right. anyway, appreciated your help on that for sure. And I, I remember the client's face. You're going to do what? You're going to go out to her house? I was like, yeah. I mean, I got this FBI guy. He's going to come with me. Anyway. And then the other one I thought of too was when you helped me on a surveillance, I tried to follow this guy to work. It was like a non-compete case. And this was my first and last surveillance gig because this was real early in the day in the work with forensics days. And I thought, surely this guy is going to go, you know, out of A and B going to work out of the paths he could take. Surely he's going to take A. And he took B. And I lost him the very first day. So then I called you up and said, I need your help. So anyway. Yeah, I think there was three of us on that. Yep. And uh, we ended up having lunch with him. Oh, that. yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. The time. That was just yeah. the timing of that. Getting him. Anyway, fun stuff. But then now you're doing all these trainings all over the place. And that's super exciting. So today I was wondering if we could discuss a case that is kind of an old case now, but I've heard you present on it several times and it's a case of public corruption. And it's also summarized if any of our listeners have the uh, ACFE's bribery and corruption case book, you're actually published in there on this case. And so I wanted to just kind of start with the background of that case, just kind of what triggered this case starting. This particular case involved Senator Gene Stipe, who at the time this started had resigned from the Senate and had given up his law license as a result of a previous case we'd worked on him involving election fraud. Okay. It was the 1998 congressional election. Hmm. Gene Stipe was on our radar, and 
he had been in, in office for 53 years, I think, the longest standing oh, senator in, in Oklahoma. Again, he'd been on our radar for a, a lot of different things, corruption-related. He had been charged with uh, corruption-related cases three separate times, one in the 1960s, one in the 70s, and then I think one in 1980, and he'd beaten all three. Oh, my. Uh, had taken all three to trial mm-hmm. and had won. So he was pretty proud of that. I recall one instance where... I'd gotten a call from this lady who had run a payroll business, just a mom and pop business, mm-hmm. very low overhead. They worked out of their house. They handled payroll for one of Gene's companies, and they didn't know it, but this company was going out of business. So the, the last payroll check didn't show up to them. They called Stipe's office and said, we're ready to make your payroll, but we need your check. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's in the mail. It's coming. So they went ahead and made payroll. It was 150000 and the check never showed up. Yeah. Uh, and they were out 150000 It put them out of business. And, oh, my uh, gosh. It was a civil matter. It was not something I could help her with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt really bad about that. Mm-hmm. But it underscored uh, the need to keep an eye on, on Stipe and his dealings. And mm-hmm. if something came up, we would be on it. In this case, I received informant information that this dog food plant that had been uh, constructed in town, they'd been working on it for a couple of years and it was supposed to open, and it hadn't yet. It was there was a local businessman that was handling that, that was uh, owned it, Steve Phipps. So I was kind of watching that and wondering mm-hmm. how that was going along. And there was uh, allegations in the newspaper about maybe some some misdeeds. So I got some informant information that they had received four hundred fifty thousand in state money, which I knew, but that the invoices that they had provided the state that the for the equipment was supposedly for new equipment, and what they had done is they'd gotten old equipment for pennies and refurbished it and, and then used that money for other things. That was interesting, and yeah. I, so I wanted to take a little bit closer look at that. So I didn't open up a case right away. Potentially, there was mm-hmm. false invoices sent, sent to the state. Yeah. So then what was kind of your next step? You hadn't yet opened a case, but what were your next steps in order to, to decide whether to open a case or not? Well, public corruption cases are are very sensitive, Mm -hmm. and you want to proceed with caution because people's reputations are at stake. Sure. And you don't want to destroy somebody's reputation with an investigation that isn't legitimate or Mm -hmm. isn't substantiated by fact. Sure. So I wanted to corroborate the information, so I did talk to other sources that I had, and also went out and took a tour of the facility. I, mm-hmm. I called Phipps up directly and said, you know, I've, I've gotten some information that maybe there's some things that are not right here. And can we visit? Can you give me a tour? Let me see what you're doing. So he agreed. And I went <laughs> out there and took a tour <laughs> Took a tour of the plant. And it was I was pretty impressed. They had restored a lot of this equipment to, to look pretty nice. Mm-hmm. And I could tell it was restored equipment, but yeah, it, and they've yeah. done a pretty nice job. And it, they were just about ready to open when I took the tour. Okay. So I talked to some of the people that were out there working and so forth. So that's, I did that before I opened up a case. I didn't get an, the answers to some of my questions were, were pretty vague and I just wasn't really satisfied. And then through other corroboration, I, I thought, well, look, we need to open up a case so I can take more, more steps yeah. to get more information. Yes. So what does opening a case look like? Well, to open a public corruption case in, in the Bureau, and, and maybe the rules have changed since mm-hmm. then, but... You do an opening memo, and it has to be approved by management. And then it also goes to FBI headquarters in D.C. for approval. So there is a process there. And Mm -hmm. what I would do is I would consult with the U.S. Attorney's Office to let them know what I had and get their thoughts on it. Is this something we could prosecute if we get the answers to at some Mm -hmm. point? So, And I would include their response in my memo. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if they weren't on board, then I, I wouldn't proceed. Right. There is a process there, Mm -hmm. and and part of that is to protect people from being investigated for political reasons. Sure, yeah. So once you get the case open, is that when you can start getting subpoenas and things like that? Correct. A grand jury is impaneled, Mm -hmm. uh, so you can get grand jury subpoenas Mm -hmm. to subpoena records and so forth. You can uh, do do all the things that you can do with an investigation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did you subpoena some records in this case when you got started? Well, I wanted to... uh, get directly to the to the bottom of these mm-hmm. invoices and this equipment. So I subpoenaed the company, the dog food the do- plant, okay. yeah. for all their records, basically asking for the kitchen sink, everything that has to do with 
the, the business, you right. know, and to include the procurement of equipment. I received a box, a couple boxes of records from them and went through them carefully. And it was one of those things where everything in there was really not relevant. And yeah. the things that I really needed <laughs> were, were not in there. <laughs> right. To me, it was an obvious attempt to obstruct mm-hmm. what I was trying to get at. Mm-hmm. That was a flag. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was one invoice in there that I, I don't think was intended to be in there. It was kind of like stapled to the back of something totally irrelevant. Mm-hmm. And it was an invoice for two hundred and something thousand dollars of equipment for this for this plant, and it had the supplier's name on it mm-hmm. and phone number, contact information. It was some place out in western Oklahoma. I looked it up on the map, and it, it was barely there. You know, it was probably one of those little towns that was a crossroads. Yeah, yeah. So I called the guy and and spoke to him and asked him about this invoice and. You know, based, based on the responses I was getting, there was more clues that there was problems here. Mm-hmm. He wasn't familiar with the invoice, even though it was over two hundred thousand right. dollars out of four hundred fifty thousand total. There was a number of invoices that had gone through him, and of course, I didn't know that at the time, mm-hmm. totaling almost over four hundred thousand dollars. And this one was for for over half of that, and he couldn't remember it. Right. You know. So ultimately, he admitted that. He had basically just papered these invoices as a favor. Mm. He was letting him create these invoices, like using his company, using like his that type name, of thing. Okay. right? And it was basically to just paper a file. Yeah. And he assumed that it was doing this legitimately, and for some reason or other, didn't have the invoices. I mean, he didn't assume that anything was illegal. Yeah. He was just trying to help a friend. Right. It just seems like like you pull on this one string and find this out and then pull on another. So kind of what was your next step after seeing that these invoices were obviously f- fake or... Well, just... that, that's I need to get the invoices. Right. So the way the funding works is the invoices came from the company and they had to be provided to the state as supporting documentation to get the funds. Okay. The first level was the Council of Governments. There's 11 councils of governments in Oklahoma and the one in for this part of the state was in Wilberton. So I got a subpoena for them uh, for their records pertaining to this Hmm. and went out there and was able to, they had the supporting invoices. Right. Including more from this company. When a check comes from the state, and it com- it's parceled out, it's not all one big $450,000 check. It sure. was uh, parceled in, in smaller amounts, and each of those had to have supporting invoices that equal that check amount. Right. That was the next step, was to get, get those invoices. Yeah, so then that gave you the totality of invoices that had been submitted by the dog food right. plant to get money from these council of right. governments. Right. Okay. But let me talk a little bit more about that meeting. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so great, great. I, I get the uh, I get these records, mm-hmm. and finished up pretty much. And the the clerk was very helpful. So I asked her. I said, "Is there anything else that you might have that would be helpful, especially pertaining to monies that came through your cog from these representatives that pertain to the dog food plan or anything else? You know, mm-hmm. is there anything else that I don't have?" She said, "Well, yeah." Uh, <laughs> okay, you I'll just got to ask, right? I'll be back. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, the, and the subpoena did cover that. So yeah. that's a, a lesson learned there is always ask that question. Yeah. You know, is there anything that you're not telling me? Uh, is there anything else that I need to know? You know, things of that nature. And mm-hmm. this, this lady was reticent to help because I think she was afraid of losing her job. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I could tell she wanted to help. Right. So that's the lesson learned. So yeah, she brought out this box of records and I ended up, it was one of those times when you call home and say, well, I'm not going to be home for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be there a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it ended up there was $3.2 million that oh had come goodness. through uh, for these for these companies you know, through different ways, but all came through this council of government. For the dog food plant or just dog food connected plant, to other businesses? Well, half of it went to the dog food plant and half went to another business that FIPS owned. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that would probably explain why the dog food plant was taking so long to right. get up yeah. if all the money is being not being used properly. So to, to get back to your question you had a few minutes ago, uh, that led to the next question was, well, how and why did this happen? Right. You know, how did this money get here? Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then why did it get here? And mm-hmm. that, that was the rest of the case, answering those two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you find out how, how the money got to the cogs? Well, of course, I, I interviewed this this lady, and she lended quite a bit of insight into it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was able to provide checks and so forth that came from the state. Right. The next step then was to or become familiar with the process mm-hmm. of how all this happens. That's when I went to Oklahoma City 
and I called the state house. And my first trip there, I met with this fellow that had actually at one time worked for the representatives who had allocated this money. Mm -hmm. And in interviewing him, he told me how it was all supposed to happen. It all sounded really great. Representatives go home when they're not in session and they listen to their constituents. They identify the needs of their constituents. They go back to the the state house and they make these needs known to the state house. And then meetings are held to prioritize these needs as to who has the greatest need. And then money is allocated through legislation, through bills. Mm -hmm. And appropriations are made to different entities throughout the state. It sounded like it's all above board. So I left there knowing that I'd been snowed, yeah. but just thinking, you know, this guy had a really great presentation. It would be nice if it was true. Right, right. <laughs> so I had a, another agent that I that I worked with, uh, worked in the city. I remember his name was Steve Kaitzer. He's retired now as well. But he uh, knew some people because uh, he worked public corruption in Oklahoma City. Okay. And so I, I made several trips back to learn how it really worked, talk to people in, inside that were willing to share how it really worked. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was really an eye-opener. And again, I think the lesson learned there is when you uh, get into an investigation where you are you don't really know what, what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, you, you have to beat that learning curve and learn. How does this really work? That way, as you do your investigation, you know what's real and what isn't, what's truthful and what's not. You've got some parameters to work, work within. So that's what I did. And it was quite a learning curve to, to get there to where I needed to be so that I could see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So how was it really working? Well, in this case, I was able to, the money was fairly easy to trace. It's, it starts out in a bill and it's, it's included somewhere in this bill under something. In this case, the money was allocated either through the Department of Agriculture mm -hmm. or the Department of Commerce. Okay. So it, it goes to them first. And then from there, it's allocated down to these councils of government. Mm -hmm. uh, through checks. Then from the Council of Government, it went to a 5013C charitable foundation. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it went to his companies. Yeah. I guess, how are the people involved kind of working together to make this happen? Like those relationships, you know, you could trace the money doing all these things, but but what was the incentive for the legislators? Or it makes sense that this businessman ends up with all this money, but right. how yeah. is everybody being incentivized? Power? <laughs> like... Well, the, the Appropriations Committee chairman at the time was the main legislator that okay. uh, was orchestrating this. Mm -hmm. And then uh, there was another legislature, legislator over the Human Resources Subcommittee that was also involved. There was three total. Okay. Uh, and then Stipe, of course, was involved. I mean, it really gets complicated. But, for example, Appropriations Committee chairman, he was hired to do marketing for some projects that never materialized. Yeah. He also received consulting fees, like 120000 mm. worth of consulting fees from a, a company that had a name. It was basically a shell company. Yeah. yeah. The money ran through. So he was getting benefit of that way. Sure. Uh, he also received some cash payments. Phipps was in the abstracting business. Him and Stipe owned 13 abstract companies. Wow. And then Phipps also had this entertainment casino machine company. Hmm. Half the $3.2 million went to that company, and one of their clients paid them in cash. Oh. So that gave them cash. Yeah. And, and cash is king. It's not traceable. Yeah. Right. All three legislators he paid in 10% of the profits of that company, he paid to them in cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just walk up with envelopes of well, cash they, or they, like... They, I mean, McAllister is a lot of good eating places down there, yeah. Italian food especially. So they would come down and so take them out to lunch, and they, they'd pass them the cash envelopes yeah. over lunch mm. under the table. <laughs> like literally under the <laughs> yeah. table. Literally, yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's take a break real quick and okay. we'll be right back. If you're a professional with continuing education requirements, then you sat through your fair share of required training hours. Let's just say you probably didn't love it. And every year the requirement hours sneak up on you at the worst time. That's why we've created the investigation game an interactive CPE training experience that qualifies for two hours of ethics continuing education. The investigation game, The Case of the Man Cave, gives players the opportunity to walk through an investigation and solve a case based on actual events. Think of it as your favorite detective game, but with an opportunity to learn while you play. Players are given case details, decision-making steps, and additional case information to then quantify the embezzlement loss, identify schemes used, and uncover assets purchased with stolen funds. 
Gameplay wraps up with a presentation providing the case solution and awards the winning teams. This valuable event makes earning continuing education hours fun by combining a real-life case study with an interactive team-building game that we think you're going to love. To learn more or to register, visit investigationgame.com. Welcome back to my interview with Gary Graff. In tracing all of this money and seeing how people were connected and the kickbacks and all of this, how many businesses did you actually discover were intertwined in all of this? I'm going to say approximately 20. Wow. And then were there lots of bank accounts? Yes. Yeah. Probably. There was, it's so easy to open a yeah. bank account once you have a business, right? Overall, we issued, I think, over 250 subpoenas for oh accounts, for separate bank accounts and, and different things like that. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, roughly 200,000 documents. Oh my. Yeah. yeah, I remember in one of your presentations, you talked about how you had to create a system in right. Excel to just track all of this and keep all of this together. Right. And that is a lot. Um, and then to ex explain it to a jury, which we might be getting ahead of ourselves. We'll, we'll come right. back to that. We'll come back to that about doing that. But in addition to tracing the money, because you know at Workman Forensics, we and what we talk about on the podcast a lot is using financial information to work cases. But as we've been talking about this case today, you just mentioned that whenever you needed to know something, you would call people up and have interviews and you had informants. So what did that add to your process? And was that a normal process for your, your investigations? Yes, uh, I mean, physical evidence is the best evidence. Sure. And, and whether it's a violent crime, any kind of crime, the physical evidence is, is fact beyond change. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, your case should be built around physical evidence. So a case like this, following the money, following contracts, all that sort of thing uh, is, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. But the witnesses should be treated with caution, especially in, in public corruption cases, because so many people have agendas and emotions are involved. And people will really believe something to be true, and it's not. So oftentimes people want to tell the truth but it's their perception is skewered by the circumstances. Sure. Uh, and it's especially true in, in political cases. So you have to, to treat your human source information with a lot of caution and, and skepticism. Sure. Uh, otherwise, you can be chasing rabbit trails that lead to nowhere. Yeah, yeah, I can totally see that. With my team a couple years ago, we kept kind of running into, we'd be talking to someone on a case and they would start explaining how something worked. And I mean, this has happened throughout mm -hmm. my entire career, and I'm sure right. you've experienced this too, but they seem so confident about what they're telling you, right? right? But it's not making sense. And so some of my team would come back and say, well, this is how they said it worked. And I said, but that doesn't make sense. And they'd say, I know, but it's just what they said. And yeah. so finally I started telling them like, you need to walk into that room, obviously with an open mind so you can understand, right. but also not doubting your intelligence right. in that. If it doesn't make sense, it right. probably doesn't make sense. So don't, I think actually you've talked about before being that person to go in and, oh man, I just don't even know what's going on here. And so then you can just keep asking questions because a lot of times I think that like in interviewing, they'll try to stay too high level or they will try to say it in a confusing way so that you really can't mm -hmm. get to the bottom of it. And just like being confident in, I can figure this out and I'm right. smart enough to figure this out. And if it doesn't make sense to me, then I need to keep asking questions. Right. Oh, absolutely. And uh, dogged determination. And again, the physical evidence uh, before you go into an interview, learn as much as you can, know as yeah. much as you can, because then you've got some facts to compare the story. Right, to. that's your baseline. Right, and sometimes it, it helps to go in and, and, and play a little dumb. Right. You know, and, mm -hmm. and just see what what they're gonna do. Right. You know, and establish their credibility or, or lack thereof, whatever, whatever the case may be. And in these types of cases, uh, you get more on the, on the one side than the other mm -hmm. uh, with politics. Yeah, so in this case too, in addition to interviews and informants and then your physical evidence, mm -hmm. your, your data. The ACFE casebook said that you did 12 search warrants. Right. The reason for this question is a lot of my clients, when we work embezzlements, they'll say, and, and they're the victims, and right. they'll say, so is the FBI or IRS just going to show up and start searching you right. know, my business on right. this embezzlement case where that subject doesn't even work there anymore? If you could kind of just talk a little bit about the search, you know, my sure. clients are kind of paranoid government's just going to show up at their business, sure. but how do search warrants actually work, and then what value do they play in this Oh, absolutely. Um, case. Well, subpoenas are generally used when the entity is compliant. Mm. Uh, for okay. example, I served a subpoena early in the case on the dog food plant. Right. And got just what they wanted me to see. 
Search warrants kind of take it to a higher level. It's a higher level of intrusion also on the entity. So if, if there's a likelihood that incriminating records may be altered mm. or destroyed, and you can articulate that, you can apply for a search warrant, and there is a process. First of all, you want to get the, the U.S. attorney on board, the prosecutor, And then ultimately, you prepare an affidavit that is usually quite lengthy. And in there, you articulate to a judge why a search warrant is necessary, why you believe this evidence is there, and why you believe you need a search warrant to get it. Particularly in in political cases or if businesses are involved, uh, judges are going to look with a little more scrutiny Mm -hmm. at at those types of of search warrants Mm -hmm. because they don't want them to be abused. Mm-hmm. So there is a process to go through, and it's it's quite lengthy and meticulous to do that. So when, w- then once you get a search warrant, then that allows you to uh, serve it on the entity. And then while you're there, you basically are in charge. They're good because they prevent evidence from being destroyed. Mm-hmm. If it hasn't been destroyed before you got there. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Obviously. Right, right. They, it's, it's, it's a surprise. There's no yeah, warning. You show right, up and, right. and search the place. Right. I, I did participate on a lot of search warrants yeah. <laughs> when I was student trainee right. at the FBI because, especially on white collar cases, because they knew I would just sit and flip through paperwork all day. Right. But right. it wasn't as exciting, I'm sure, as others. But well, I recall one one uh, search warrant was uh, on an accounting business. Oh, okay. That Stipe's accounting business. Mm. And you know, I hated doing that one, but I had evidence that he was potentially covering mm. for Stipe. I didn't want to lose those records, particularly the computer all the computer sure. data and so forth. So yep. uh, the judge agreed for that particular warrant. I knew it was it was really intrusive on a business, so I didn't want to shut the business down. Right. So I requested that all the computers be imaged on site so mm. that they, when we left, they could continue running their yeah. business as yeah. opposed to taking all their computers <laughs> sure. and shutting them down. Yeah. So it took a lot of extra co- uh, computer capability to, mm-hmm. to, to bring along on that one. Yeah, but uh, we had some some really good folks in, in the city, Oklahoma City, that mm-hmm. uh, were, were really good at that support, mm-hmm. uh, and they came out and we mirror imaged that whole. You can imagine how much data there was. Yeah, I'm sure. We mirror time. image the whole the whole place. This has been a while, but do you remember if those computers did give you some good information? You know, yeah, they did. But I, yeah. I recall one piece of information we got out of there that we probably would not would have would not have received had it not been a search warrant, mm. and that was a memo. To put that in perspective, one of the, the initial four hundred fifty thousand dollars that came in, mm-hmm. there was a forty eight thousand dollar kickback on that mm-hmm. that went through Stipe, and Stipe paid it to, with a with a check, oh. and put it on his books as a loan. Mm-hmm. After a couple of years passed, uh, nothing was said about it, mm-hmm. so he wrote it off as a bad debt. Mm. <laughs> yep. So uh, then it hit the newspaper that this investigation was underway. Uh So he wrote a a memo, there was a memo to his accountant to put that back on the loan. To put the loan back on? (laughs) Oh my. And you found that loan during the search? We found that memo in in the search. Yeah. So that was was exhibit A, if you would, when we went to trial. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I remember reading in your case story in the bribery and corruption handbook that, or case book, that the affidavit mm-hmm. portion of a search warrant is sometimes helpful in a public corruption case. Right. Can you explain that a little bit? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one is the search warrant and the affidavit itself becomes public. Yeah. In the case of the gaming business, when we executed that search warrant, the manager of that entity became a cooperator. Oh, okay. He, he was able yeah. to, to see yeah. the writing on the wall, if yeah. you will, and saw the need to get on the right side of this. Yeah. So affidavits sometimes can be helpful in, in helping people to realize who's likely to win all this at the end of the day Yeah. and, and get on the right team. Yeah. And, and hopefully that's our team. Right. So they, they can be helpful in that regard. So it's a little more granular, but whenever the search warrant and the affidavit become public, is it usually the local newspaper or, you know, different areas of the press that are monitoring those things that then let people know about it? Well, Or yeah. just people talking? Both. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if somebody's, other. if the FBI is showing up at a business right. in a small town, you're, everybody's probably going to right. know about it. But. Right, So in this case, uh, the media was tracking this case, and they're yeah. doing their own investigation, I think, different media outlets, uh, entities were. So they would be attuned to, to mm-hmm. affidavits and such. Yeah, they'd be watching for that. Mm-hmm. 
So what was the disposition of this case? Stipe and his brother were indicted. Okay. Uh, this is the second time around now for their part in it, and they, they had a, a part of it. Stipe was not involved in the gaming mm -hmm. business, but he was involved in a silent partner in a dog food plant. Okay. And he helped orchestrate that money and the kickback that right. was associated with it. Uh, they were both indicted, and then Stipe was able to convince the judge that he had some mental issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, they sent him off to Springfield for evaluation. He was up there for about three months. There was a prison up there that mm -hmm. uh, evaluates this sort of thing. And apparently he was able to convince them that he had some issues. Wow. And okay. it, was, it was all orchestrated, mm -hmm. I found out later. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, for, but to hold that, I mean, to yeah. convince somebody for several months, oh well, my goodness. He is an attorney and a politician. So. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need to say anything? Oh, gosh. Uh, so his brother ended up going to trial. He was convicted. And then Phipps pled guilty. Mike Mass pled guilty. There was a couple of other legislators. One went to trial, actually twice, and he was acquitted. Oh, wow. Um, on, on this case? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then... The state auditor and his wife were associated with this. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a, a parallel case, a lot of intertwining. Yeah. And they went to trial, and they were both convicted at trial. Okay. You know, a, a lot of my embezzlement cases, you show somebody, this check came out of the business bank account and went into your personal bank account, and you kind of walk through those steps. But it seems like even in public corruption, you can show them a money trail, but they still want to go to trial. And so do you know their rationale for why they want to do that? I have my own opinion. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes we're, we're dealing with people that are really arrogant and full of themselves and they rationalize mm -hmm. this behavior. They're doing it for the public good. Oh, yeah. So they don't look in the mirror and, and see anything bad. They view us as having political motivation oftentimes. Mm -hmm. To and take course, them out. Yeah, and of yeah. course they'll accuse us of it. Yeah, they, they decide they're going to go on the trial, you know, and they're not rather than admit that they might have done something wrong. Very interesting. Well, it's, uh, it, I mean, these, but these like are you said, very a difficult people, investigations. Very yeah. difficult. Well, and if they make it super complicated, right. and I mean, you can simplify it, you know, and you can work to be creative of, about how to simplify that for a jury, but mm -hmm. but they've set it up. I mean, 20 companies, all these bank accounts, right. at some point that just becomes overwhelming to a jury. It almost seems like it's intentionally confusing from the beginning. Oh, it is. It, in preparation for if they're ever right. called to it, then hopefully you won't want to untangle it. You know, right. hopefully they won't end up with an agent who's willing to take the time to, to piece those things together, which is really a bummer. Well, and sometimes these folks will take the stand. They're very charismatic people. Oh, yeah. They can influence the jury. Yeah. And the, the jury will believe them over the evidence. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, all you can do is the best you can do. Right. Uh, and you, they don't. The outcome isn't always what you would prefer it to be. Right. Yeah. In this case, though, several people were convicted, which right. I think is which is what needed to happen. And then also, I think just having a case be brought to light like this—that it can't happen in the background anymore. Right. Even if they are acquitted, people still know that this happened. Right. And right. can just be a little more suspect, which kind of leads me into one of my last questions: is my team and I are focusing our research on identifying trends to detect fraud so that we can maybe help the public at large, you know, just fraud in areas that could harm the pu public at large. And, and what are some things that we can start testing to kind of, you know, look for red flags. And so in the area of these public funds, what are some of the things that maybe our team could watch for? Because it seems like within this process that you described earlier, there would be some things that could trigger, hmm, I wonder what's happening here, you know, and to create some, some awareness of when you see these things, you should maybe think critically about it. Well, I know the 501c3 is horribly abused, the yeah. charitable foundations. Yeah, uh, I get that. I, I learned later on as I was doing this is that is a, a standard practice for funneling money to people is mm -hmm. to have them set up one of these charitable foundations. So that, that in itself is, right. is, is something to be aware of. They're used extensively mm -hmm. because it's, the, the appearance uh, is good. You know, mm -hmm. we're giving this, this money's going to this charitable foundation. Right. In this case, it was the Rural Development Foundation. Right. It presents a good appearance, and a lot of times folks won't even 
look any deeper than that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one big flag. As far as the, the kickbacks, I mean, there's so many different ways. Loans is, is one way. That's used a lot. Consulting fees, hire the person up as a consultant. Yeah. And who's to say whether their consulting is any good or, or how right. much of what they're doing? You know, it's, 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 right. it's like nail and jello to a wall. Right. So consulting fees are used. Attorney fees and retainers. Oh, yeah. Are very, very common. A lot of these folks, a lot of these politicians are attorneys mm -hmm. and they have a law firm. Mm -hmm. So if you want to have a visit with so and so to to pitch them something that you want money for, well, you, you give them a $50,000 retainer, mm -hmm. you know, and then that gets you the first interview. Right, right. And that stuff happens all the time. And there's no way to, to prove yeah. that it's. That didn't happen. That, it's, that, it, that it is what it is. Yeah. You know, so that's another way. Of course, speaking fees, exorbitant oh. speaking fees, we, we see a lot of that. That's mm. that's that's a favor being returned, mm -hmm. you know. Hiring and making payments to family and friends. That's another yeah. very common way of, of the quid pro quo. You know, sure. that's the other half of it. That's really hard to, to prove mm -hmm. that that's, uh, something nefarious is going on there. Of course, the shell companies right. uh, to disguise the money transactions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Stipe, he set up this one company in 1959, oh you know, that he used as part of this in 1998 yeah you know and you look at the bank records and the, the company will go for years without any any transactions <laughs> and then all of a sudden <laughs> and all of a sudden there's some things going on so yeah um, wow just like have these businesses <laughs> and bank accounts just parked in case you need to take a kickback yeah, and they're already set up right yeah. Right. So yeah, when you when you start doing your homework on these companies, all well, that was set up 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, it must be legitimate, right? Right. And to some extent, it is maybe, but maybe it was originally. Yeah. And then in kind of tracing those, so you've got these loans and consulting fees. If you can connect those fees to public funds, is that what helps make your case? Connect it to those appropriated well, funds, or does that still kind of fall having, in the gray that's area? That's where having witnesses is important okay. to, to yeah. connect. To make sense of these transactions. To kind of give you the context right. of what was happening. Right. Yeah. And of course it has to be a credible witness. Right. Uh, that doesn't have too much baggage. Right. And unfortunately the folks that are involved in the scheme have baggage right from the start. When you're going forward you have to take that into account. Yeah. Because the defendant's and, attorney is going to use that at trial. Absolutely. Pull up every absolutely. skeleton. I, you know. Right. Skeletons in everybody's closets. Yeah. Right. I mean th these are very very tough cases to work. Yeah. <laughs> very tough well we appreciate your work on this one in oklahoma and um i appreciate you being on the podcast today oh, thank you hopefully you uh, said something that might benefit some investigator somewhere yeah i'm sure i'm sure it will i mean i know i'm better for it so <laughs> thanks for being on the podcast all right thank you the investigation game podcast is a production of workman forensics for more information about the topics we discuss on each episode, please visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. You can also connect with us on any of the social media platforms by searching Workman Forensics. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for the podcast, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com.